I'm starting the I'm starting the recording, and uh, it is my pleasure, of course, to welcome Stephen Phillips, uh, who is presented here a couple of times, but now he is coming at it from a totally different angle. Uh, first, he was presenting on CBDCs. This is a CBDC-like product, of course, stable coins. Uh, so he'll let us know how things are coming along at Fluent, what the protocol does uh, to safeguard against uh, all the things that we know are problematic with uh, stable coins. Uh, and let's not waste any more time and have Stephen Phillips present. Thank you, as always. Right. All right, thank you, Vipin. Can you guys hear me okay? Can you see me okay? Yes, uh, we yeah. see your fabulous turban <laughs> and the insignia on it and Fantastic. everything else. Fantastic. You know. Well, thank you, Vipin. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to present to the Financial Market Special Interest Group on the Fluent Protocol. And of course, our first product, the reason why we're all here, the US dollar stablecoin USD+. It's very warming to see some uh, friendly names in the audience um, so you guys can sit back, relax, and I think we'll have a very good discussion today. So for those that haven't met me before, a brief backstory on myself. I've, I've specialized in financial technology innovation and distributed technologies focusing on blockchain, digital assets, and crypto economy since 2016. I've led the product design, development, and implementation of central bank digital currency technology. As Vipin mentioned, uh, where key clients include the Central Bank of Nigeria, the Af Africa's largest economy, and the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, the world's first and only CBDC deployment for our currency union. Regarding the Fluent Protocol um, and the USD Plus uh, stablecoin, I've been leading the product development for this protocol from about March this year, so not very long. And um, I've been supported by a truly amazing team who I want to thank. And I'm, I'm excited to introduce our protocol to this audience. So I think we can get started. So just a bit of an overview. We, this presentation is relatively short, about 15, 20 minutes as an introduction. Um, the next few slides are gonna set some context, history, track record of stable coins and kind of set the foundation for the problem that we're addressing with our unique product. From there, we get more into Fluent protocol and also the USD Plus product that we've created. So without further ado, let's get going. So we begin with a brief introduction on the taxonomy of stable coins. Um, many of you on the call will already be familiar. For some, there may be some new things here. So I'll just set a, a nice foundation that we can all be on the same page. So in a nutshell, very simply put, a stable coin is a cryptocurrency with a fixed price. It's, you know, it doesn't need to be more complex than that. A stable coin's value is usually tied to that of a fiat currency. Those are the very popular ones that are tied to a fiat currency with the US dollar stable coins dominating the market and providing utility to cryptocurrency markets. So we will examine that utility in a little bit of detail as we move through the presentation. It is important to note that stable coins can be pegged to commodities like gold or silver, indexes, and for some, even a combination of these types of assets. Given that all stable coins as financial products are not created equally, as seen by the many dimensions in the taxonomy on this slide, investors and markets, users who are interested in leveraging stable coins face a tremendous challenge of navigating this complex landscape to assess risk associated with capital efficiency, price stability, collateralization, and also decentralization. So examining the, tax the taxonomy, we note 
that collateral types and amounts, as well as the mechanism for the peg for stable coins are recognized as key product dimensions. Generally, when you talk about a stable coin, these are the three kind of key areas that you focus in on. You know, what, what is the collateral type? What is the amount of the collateral? And what is the mechanism for the peg? So they each have their own intricacies that can have an impact on the potential outcomes of the product like price stability and the peg during market stress events. So in short, the design elements of, of stable coins and risk associated with each stable coin on the market are likely to be very different. So in a nutshell, what I'm saying is it's not as simple as just picking something from each of these categories. You know, there's a, there's a holistic product view that you must take and each choice that you make in the taxonomy as you bring together different um, attributes of a stable coin, it has downstream implications. So next, we will move into why it will continue to grow in adoption. US dollar stable coins continue to provide, to provide important utility for cryptocurrency markets. And they do this by providing on and off ramps from and to traditional financial markets. Stable coins provide a simple mechanism for retail markets and institutional investors to reduce their crypto exposure without cashing out entirely to fiat currency. This important utility cannot be overlooked. Due to the inherent volatility of cryptocurrencies, we know that presumably you don't want to always hold cryptocurrencies. You want to uh, leverage a stable coin to kind of reduce risk and to uh, gain, you know, your earnings. This ability for traders to navigate the crypto market freely and adjust their exposure when it matters with a safe and stable asset is critical. So that's the general um, value of a stable coin. And there are some other downstream values, which we'll get to, but it's clear that existing fiat peg stable coins have shortcomings. And it makes them more susceptible to depegging events and expose, when exposed to market stress. So the, the existing framework for how uh, stable coins currently in the market are created, you know, the various attributes they have, it does have a number of shortcomings, which we will touch on on, on the next slide. Demand for utility has driven growth. We now see that we have a market cap over 150 billion US dollars. And this is driven by DeFi protocols, the need to have a safe haven asset, as we touched on, um, when you want to reduce risk from, from holding cryptocurrencies. And this all comes with its own challenges and problems, as we will see on the next slide. So now moving into the challenges. So as we think about the shortcomings, the primary ones can be summarized as a lack of transparency, little regulatory oversight, which leads to consumer protection issues, and finally, crippled convertibility. The primary reason for these shortcomings can be attributed, in my opinion, to centralization. Many stable coins are issued by a single company where this company is also the single custodian of the reserves back in the same stable coin. Due to the current environment where there's little regulatory oversight, Stablecoin companies op operate. Stablecoin companies do not operate with clear guidelines for creating transparency of their reserve um, backends for their stablecoin. If the market, for any reason, becomes concerned with the legal status of the issuing company or the legitimacy of the collateral for reserves to back the stablecoin, we can have a scenario where the convertibility of the stablecoin can be crippled. And what I'm basically saying is here, you can, you can have delisting from exchanges, um, companies no longer want to accept your stable coin, et cetera, et cetera. And this has downstream implications for the market. What if you are holding that stable coin? You know, it creates problems for you. Maybe me think about consumer protection and regulators are very interested in how these events can have impacts on, on the market. At worst, Entities like exchanges and other market participants will stop accepting the stablecoin. And as we look to the future of stablecoins, how would we go about 
solving these issues. So now we start to transition into the solutions. How are we going to go about solving these issues? All right. So we want to solve these issues by leveraging the best features from existing stable coins. So this is kind of version 2.0 as we start to introduce uh, the Fluent Protocol and USD Plus. We want to demonstrate how this is an evolutionary step in stablecoin products. Price stability from, from fully fiat collateral backed stablecoins, uh, providing the legitimacy of collateral backing with real time on chain chat transparency and fully integrating with the existing regulatory frameworks of traditional financial institutions. So again, if we want to address these issues we saw in the previous slide, these are the things we would sort of think about bringing together. We want a, a fully collateral back stable coin, and we want to be able to prove in real time that collateral backing to provide full transparency to the market. And lastly, we want to leverage a regulatory framework. And we believe in our protocol, we leverage the traditional financial institutions that we all know and trust to accomplish this. So the Fluent Protocol and the USD Plus stablecoin represents an evolutionary step in stablecoin products by combining three key attributes to provide that price stability we touched on, the on-chain collateral transparency, as well as the regulatory oversight. Leveraging the existing regulatory frameworks within a federation of issuing licensed financial institutions. So again, here we're talking about decentralization. It's not, it's not just one entity. We have a federation of multiple banks that issues this um, USD plus stablecoin. Fluent eliminates the threat of single entity insolvency, mitigates the threat of bank runs, offers greater consumer protections, dramatically increased liquidity and guarantees one-to-one -one redemption of USD plus for bank customers who will have the freedom of exchanging US dollars and USD plus at a federation member bank of their choice. And more on that later in the presentation, we'll explain how this all works. It's important that I say here that it works no different to any other stable coin in terms of how you can use it and where it's available, et cetera. But the issuing, the, the kind of lower layers of the framework are what we've significantly improved on. Additionally, our protocol is designed to be extensible and adaptable to other fiat currencies beyond USD to support key international regions such as Latin America, Asia, as well as Europe. So next we move into a high level architecture. Fluent architecture, has three layers. We have an enterprise layer, a private layer, and a public layer, which is where the stable coin actually list, lives. To address and uh, to, uh, to provide the key attributes of price stability again, collateral transparency, and regulatory oversight discussed on the previous slides. At a high level, you know, just touching on it, we'll go into these in more details. The enterprise layer offers deep integrations into the core banking system of federation member licensed financial institutions or banks. This provides sound reg regulatory foundations for the protocol, leveraging established frameworks for, for, for fiat currency and custody of fiat currency. The private layer, which we call FNET and is built on, on a private cordon network is a bridge that connects core banking systems within the federation of member banks to the public layer. It also houses business logic of the protocol and you know, triggers compliance, various other things within the business logic. The public layer is where USD plus exists and where the Fluent protocol delivers on real-time transparency of reserve collateral. So again, this is just a high level architecture. We'll now move into each individual layer and shed some more light to help the, the narrative and to explain in more detail how this all works and why this is uh, the most trustworthy stable coin. So moving into examining the banking layer in more detail, 
Uh, this layer provides the regulatory framework that puts a high demand for security, reporting, and compliance. Uh, KYC requirements, BSA, AML requirements, these protect customers, investors, and the financial institutions themselves. They require financial institutions to, the protocol requires financial institutions to register wallets, linking them to a verified identity. Demand deposits ensures that the fiat collateral is both FDIC insured and highly liquid to support fiat to crypto conversions and maintain the one-to-one -one peg. This is super important. Traditional Rails provides a regulatory framework for moving capital into and out of crypto, both domestically and internationally, to form a, to, to and from any federation member. So traditional rails are leveraged for moving that fiat as, as fiat moves between banks today. The Fluent Protocol benefits from deep integrations into the core banking layer at the Federation members via interlinks with APIs. This ensures both seamless straight through processing with direct access to the collateral accounts to trigger minting and burning transactions, as well as eliminating custodial risk. By, re by reporting on key performance indicators within the Federation member. These are generally around banking operations and they include metrics for, for each Federation member that provide insight into liquidity, profitability of the bank, credit, solvency, and operations of the bank as it pertains to USD+. This ethos for transparency ensures that USD plus will be the most trusted stablecoin. So a big mouthful there on this slide, but the, the, the Federation member banks and the API access into these banks provides a very strong foundation. First of all, we are, we are leveraging the existing regulatory framework, and then we have these APIs that provide real-time visibility into the liquidity, the profitability of the bank, solvency, and the operations. This allows Fluent Protocol and USD Plus to be proactive rather than reactive. We can see things happening in advance. We can move liquidity to other banks so we can ensure the safety and soundness of the protocol and of USD Plus. That's a super important point. Um, next, we take a deep dive into the private layer, FNET. This layer houses core business logic for the Fluent Protocol, as discussed. And there we have things like fees, compliance frameworks, accounting for the fiat collateral, and uh, the different Federation member banks. The direct access to the collateral accounts that we discussed on previously via the APIs provides Fluent Protocol with real-time or daily reconciliation of reserves removing the need to wait months, in some cases, for a third time, for a third party audit of or attestation. And this is again accomplished via those interlinked APIs into the core banking systems. Public and, and also the public attestation of reserves. FNET uses the APIs provided by Federation member bank core banking systems to transmit reserve account balances to the public layer providing a level of transparency not previously seen for a stable coin. So again, this is one of the key differentiators, this real-time visibility of reserves um, that is provided through these APIs directly into the core banking layer. This level of insight also allows the protocol, as I mentioned, to be proactive in addressing potential issues rather than being reactive after the issue has occurred. FNET is responsible for passing requests from Federation member banks to the public layer for minting and enforces a one-to-one -one relationship for fiat and collateral accounts um, to have the USD plus minted. So in other words, we need to have the fiat in the reserve account prior to minting and FNET manages all of that business logic. This mechanism ensures that the Fluent Protocol is able to maintain its one-to-one -one peg with USD. FNET also provides a low friction way to ensure that USD plus can be redeemed at any Federation member, regardless of which Federation member originally minted it. The FNET layer acts as an internal settlement system for the Federation as well, 
facilitating reconciliation of fiat collateral across Federation member banks via the netting, and this can be done via traditional rails. So the FNET layer is where a lot of the business logic is, and it also provides that interconnectedness. It kind of bridges a traditional financial world with fiat and core banking systems to the public layer with cryptocurrencies and provides the business logic to do this in a safe and sound manner. Next, we will look at the public layer in some detail. So of course, the public layer is where USD Plus resides and it's designed for all standard and legal DeFi stablecoin use cases, including payments, trading, remittance, basically just like any other stablecoin today. The enterprise layer and the private layer, they, those two layers address the, cust the custodial credit risk. Again, they provide the strong regulatory framework for consumer protection as well as a mechanism for real-time transparency of reserves. The USD Plus public layer provides the universal visibility with real-time auditing of the Federation members and the fiat collateral. So that real-time auditing, again, that is via the APIs, looking at those operational key performance indicators that we touched on for liquidity, um, for, for other um, attributes as well that we touched on in the previous slides. The contracts for USD Plus in particular offer inbuilt controls for maximum safety and compliance with BSA, Banking Secrecy Act, AML, KYC regulations. Through the protocol, mint and burn requests for USD Plus are delivered and received from registered consumers who have been enrolled onto the protocol by their licensed financial institution. This ensures that all participants interacting on the port of protocol directly are known and verifiable. So taking a step back here, anyone can use USD plus, you know, you have an ERC20 compliant wallet, you can have USD plus. But if you're interacting with the protocol directly to mint or to burn, you need to be verified by a licensed financial institution. The protocol tracks the movement of USD plus to and from registered wallets with automated and continuous address, wallet, and transaction screening to provide real-time alerts, which is able to prevent interactions with illicit actors. So there you have it. We've gone through all three of the layers, and we understand how leveraging the, the core banking system in the enterprise layer, how FNET, how they solve these problems of credit risk and transparency. As, as well as um, accessibility and decentralization. Next, we will look at how stable coin customers are able to access USD Plus via traditional means. So as I mentioned, peer-to-peer -peer transfers, trading on centralized or decentralized exchanges, this is all valid use cases. USD Plus customers are not limited to transactions with Federation member banks only. As I said, you know, you just need an ERC20 wallet and you can transact USD Plus, you can go on an, an exchange, you can get access to it. It's only when you want to interact with the protocol directly that you need to be verified. So customers are still able to transact with USD Plus like any other stable coin. Federation member banks provide additional on and off ramps with fiat currency because they are regulated entities authorizing minting and burning of USD plus. And as federation and as a federation, they hold the entirety of the fiat collateral. USD plus is thus the most trustworthy and adoption ready US dollar stablecoin. All right, so it's definitely a new day. Um, you know, I hope you guys have enjoyed the presentation. It was brief, um, lots of meat in there. I am ready and available for your questions. Thank you, Vipin. You mean, thank you, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> um, although we may look alike, Stephen is uh, definitely the more uh, striking of the both of us. Uh, but some people uh, cannot see beyond the surface. Anyway, uh, <laughs> um, 
There are a couple of questions on the chat, which are mm -hmm. more about particulars. Uh, and let me uh, read them out. Okay, I will try my best. Uh, does the Fluent Protocol support CBDC as well? A digital dollar versus today's fiat USD. That is Mohan Venkatraman from Chain Yard. Okay, should I start there? Yes. Uh, so you know, we'll we'll go deeper in a minute. Sure. So does it support um, CBDC? CBDC? Yes. Yes. I would say yes, it supports CBDCs in terms of uh, collateral backing. Um, central bank uh, issued currency is definitely a safe haven asset. So let's say the um, the, the Fed was or, or the Treasury were to issue um, a digital asset, a central bank issued digital asset in the U.S. jurisdiction. I would suggest that that would be a very safe asset to back um, the USD plus uh, stable coin. So it can be integrated in that sense. But again, the, the stable coin is uh, issued on a public network, which is more providing a bridge to DeFi and cryptocurrency, whereas a, a CBDC is more of a, of a private permissioned network that we've seen deployed so far globally on all private permission networks which um, gives the central bank more control and is currently they're not interoperable between public networks and these private permission networks. So I, I would suggest that it can be leveraged as part of the collateral backend because it's a very safe asset. It's issued by the government. So, you know, um, I think it will be even better than FDIC insured um, reserve accounts. The second one is, uh, does anyone apply to just U.S. Federation members, or can they be any bank? So, great question. Um, as mentioned during the presentation, the Federation member banks are the ones that are issuing the USD+. Plus. So, they're the ones that hold the liability against uh, the, the pool of reserves, so to speak. So... If you, want to inter if you want to interact with the protocol directly, you need to form a relationship with a Federation member bank. You can then deposit reserves. You can then deposit your fiat into the reserve account, into the collateral account, at which point um, the, the protocol will mint the USD plus and deliver it to your wallet. So if you want to interact with the protocol directly, you do need a relationship with the bank, with a Federation member bank or licensed institution. However, um, USD Plus, as we discussed, will also be available on cryptocurrency exchanges, et cetera, where you can, if you have Bitcoin or other assets, you can go in and swap and get your USD Plus if you want to hold USD Plus as a better safe haven asset to the existing stable coins in market. Um, let me uh, continue on that vein a little bit. Sure. Is the list of uh, banks uh, known, meaning suppose tomorrow I want to start doing this. Can I, I mean, which bank should I be uh, KYC by so that I can use USD plus? Sure, that's a good question. So part of it is we need to discuss where we are on our roadmap. Um, I did have a roadmap slide, but I opted to take it off. So we are currently in our alpha release um, uh, by the end of this year, we will have a beta release, which will uh, provide limited uh, uh, availability for a select few um, clients as we iron out any kinks and we, we go to market finally in Q1 next year. So we contemplate a federation of maybe five to eight banks, and these will be tier one banks um, to, for, for go to market. Um, so if you wanted to get access to USD plus, you would need to, to leverage one of those banks initially until the, until USD plus it, trading pairs are on exchanges, et cetera, at which point you don't need to go to a bank to, to hold USD plus you can, you can get it from an exchange, et cetera. But 
Um, do you have commitments from these tier one banks? I mean, are, yeah. are they? Mm -hmm. We have we have signed MOUs. We have a few commitments. Um, we have a, a federation agreement, and banks are signing on. Of course, you know when we go to market and and we demonstrate the product, and there is increasing demand, we expect more of an influx of of, of banks wanting to get onto the federation, especially because uh, the federation offers internal settlement between these banks as well. So there are some additional value propositions for the for the banks joining the federation of itself. Um, another question by Sandy. Please explain a rationale behind choosing Corda, in this case against one of the hyperledger chains. Can you please share some comparison info that was used to make this critical decision? Thanks. Yes. So um, there is a bit of detail here that I didn't really prepare off the top of my head. I know Corda has this unique value proposition of, I think it's called something like states or state changes or something. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it allows for building processes in very easily, which is something that we find very valuable for the business logic. Um, I'm not a Corda expert by any stretch of the imagination, but I believe that was the key reason for using Corda, being able to build in those processes. And for any uh, you know, R3 veterans on the call, you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, you know, being able to build those processes in in a very simple and easy way it was, was, it was the rationale behind using uh, Corda. Yeah, I was um, one of the first uh... Uh, members of R3, uh, um, let's say, launch committee. Good. Well, help uh, me out. <laughs> tell me, tell me what the terminology uh, is. I know there's a specific... no, but but there is somebody else here who's uh, um, even more of an expert, having built lots of uh, stuff on Corda. In fact, we together proposed something that looks like this as a dual chain approach uh, to issue CBDCs. Right. And we even have a uh, lab uh, built with, without that dual structure, but uh, the dual structure was proposed, but that's Mani Pillai who is also asking some questions here because I think he knows um, you know, enough about Corda and about mm. how to leverage this, you know, Corda on the one hand and then the public chain. So he's asking, how does the protocol address confidentiality as opposed to current pseudo anonymity? Right. Sure. So we we leverage um, the the financial institutions that make up um, the the Ethernet layer. So if you could imagine each federation member will have a node on the Corda network and um, you know, the personally identifiable information for customers uh, doesn't, it's not transmitted. It's, it's, you know, we leverage, first of all, we capture as minimum information as the protocol needs. And that information is housed securely within the node of the federation member bank. So basically the information we need is just the bank account uh, for redemptions. So let's say you wanna redeem USD plus, we, know, we need to know where to send it to you, the protocol does. Um, and so we would obviously have your, your wallet address that was registered. Um, so just very, and your email address, very basic information. We leverage the KYC, the customer information file, all of that stays within the core banking system. And um, don't forget, we have those deep integrations into the core banking system via APIs that can offer um, support to the protocol for verifying different things, et cetera. So that's how we handle it. We handle it by not by having a very light touch, so to speak. Uh, so on the public chain, it's only your wallet. Yeah, that's it. Only your wallet address. Which is what um, 
money is calling pseudo anonymity because you know there are ways of uh, piercing that veil mm -hmm. uh, that uh, you know burqa uh, you can actually go and see through correlations and other ways you know there are many companies who do this yes. so really speaking you do not have through confidentiality you have that pseudo anonymity which is a yeah feature but, not a yeah. bug of of ethereum <laughs> <laughs> yeah but no no different to any other stable coin i would assume yes uh but you know let's be very uh honest okay that that's a tough ask to be yes. honest uh, obviously, so. obviously, you are representing fluent. You have to, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's it's almost like a marketing pitch in a way. <laughs> but, but oh. you know, we have to be, you know, as objective members of of the listening public, so to say, mm. uh, we can ask questions. Sure, sure. Uh, um, and uh, it's not meant as a dis disrespect, but more as you know trying to find out how it is different mm. and what are the similarities to the existing yes. uh, yeah. uh, stable coins and potentially um leveraging different networks beyond ethereum to mint and burn usd plus can can add some uh value so for instance you you may prefer to use hedera or cordano etc for your usd plus as opposed to ethereum if you don't like the privacy or you you're aware of various threat vectors within ethereum based on your particular use cases so on our roadmap we are planning to to issue usd plus on multiple networks well there's also the issue of um, cost because, sure. because transaction cost on Ethereum can be high. Very it, high, yeah. And it varies. Um, there is another question by Money which says, uh, what is the profile of the sponsoring banks of this protocol? Which, I mean, which is similar to the question that you sort of answered before, but maybe you can throw some more light on that. Sure. So we we want uh, the best, the highest quality banks we can get. Of course, uh, tier one banks, banks that are familiar with managing, you know, tens if not hundreds of billions of dollars with assets under management. Um, uh, there's another question here: Can non-US uh, tier one banks participate? I would say yes. However, it's not our priority want right now. Uh, as we go to market, we want to build as much trust in the market as possible. Um, so we would consider it, um, but the priority would be, you know, those reputable names that manage large amounts of assets um, that, that will, in my belief, give the protocol the most trust and the most credibility um, for go to market. Is there a sandbox version of this, which can be implemented on a small scale, non USD currency? Question mark. That's Shiba. I, I think that's a good idea. Um, we currently are very much focused on getting USD plus into the market. Um, the potential for a sandbox version is there. Of course, we have multiple environments uh, that can be seen as a sandbox as we test on test nets for various protocols, et cetera. Um, but not a formalized product that you can sign up for and utilize that may be something that we that we consider um, early next year um, for, for for different use cases. You know, you can come and sign up for a sandbox and and use it for different use cases. Does anybody else have any more questions? Otherwise, I'll money you. Uh, yeah, uh, Vipin. Um, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Um, again. Uh, First to address on the Corda, Corda side, yes, it's a privacy oriented uh, chain and the main main advantage is a layer two protocol for privacy. So mm -hmm. 
it's a point to point network rather than a, a layer one, which is the most pop blockchains are, which is a broadcasting network. So yep. that's a big difference. And in, so you, you really don't have to, uh, you know, if you want to communicate with anyone on the layer two or on the quota network, you're free to communicate as long as they are in the same network. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's the reason. I mean, in fact, as Vipin pointed out, we did present to the, a similar architecture for CBDCs, um, uh, you know, uh, as in we, we wrote a white paper last year. I mean, more, okay. Uh, Is it last year or the year before? <laughs> yeah, I, for, before. I forget. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and on our side, yes, we do actually build um, trade file or enterprise digital assets with the same concept, a layer one, right. any public mm -hmm. network, a layer two is quota network. So uh, the architecture is no different. And so we are all in sync with that. Now, Very having, good. having said all of that, it, mm -hmm. the fact, having having had lots of conversations with the banks, the we circle back to the same old issue of confidentiality on layer one, which is where banks are you know, stuck right now. They, they do not want a pseudo anonymous uh, other structure as we have in, in, in the blockchains today. So even we had a conversation with the major European bank a couple of days back and the US banks here all have the same issue. How do you address confidentiality, which goes back to zero knowledge proofs and implementing and it's still, it's a work in progress. So I just want to, you know, I mean, if you have it in the pipeline, that's fine. Mm -hmm. but something that, you know, my advice is you ought to tackle on early on if you really want to have you know, uh, adoption. Sure. I take the point and I, and I trust you guys tremendously. <laughs> well, hey, money, if I may, this is Sandy here. Uh, if I may just uh, chime in on that. So please help me understand. When you say Coda is actually acting as layer two in this case, so could we assume that, and let's say you had any other layer two, be Polygon or something like that, uh, you could have used that now. I do understand that the goal here is not performance, like like scaling as in Polygon, but if it's a question of using uh, basically uh, uh, not directly using one of the layer ones, uh, theoretically you could have used Basu in this case, uh, right? Uh, or even used Polygon instead of Coda. Like I'm not against Coda. In fact, I definitely uh, started my uh, you know uh, blockchain and starting with uh, Your point is right. Um... The, the reason is that is if we are to represent uh, trade five contracts and asset definitions directly on on any layer one chain, the cost of representing this is very very high, and also defining contracts. So if you are going to getting into a bond, the bond has very you know various clauses that you need to record on chain, uh, and it's very expensive to record this thing on Ethereum or in any other layer one chains because Absolutely. the costs are very high. And that's why. Corda helps you with that. And also on top of that, it's a privacy oriented, right? In, in, in the Corda network, if you are having to distribute a bond to only hundred of your customers, only those hundred customers need to know about the bond and the bond definition and you're interacting with them and actually can build a, 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 a secondary market structure using RFQs, that's what we have built. So there's a lot of built-in privacy that comes in. In Hyperledger, uh, if you look at the fabric, it is doable, but it, it kind of involves channels and it, it, every time you have to create more channels and there's an infinite number of channels you have to build. And so Cora in that way is much, much more open. So I wouldn't go too far into technical terms, but they are all compatible. In layer two, you can say Hyperledger, Fabric, Corda, or digital assets, DAML, they are all look uh, uh, alike. Uh, they provide a kind of, let's call it a business level privacy. Uh, what, else, what I'm asking for is, asset level privacy at layer one, which is the confidentiality. That's a tough one uh, to implement. No one has done it yet. So, yeah. So, th thank you, buddy. That, that explains. So, should we go into a little more detail of other questions? Does anybody else have questions? Yeah, I'll, I'll throw in one more. Um, which is the, um, how will building trust between banks into an USD plus network? This is something that we are facing as well. When we start talking to the banks, as an individual bank, they don't mind minting their own coins, distributing to their own clients, trading with them and settling with them. 
But the moment you introduce two or more banks, and particularly that particular, in this case, USD plus is exposed to a crypto market, banks are very hesitant because they have no control over the process. And someone in theoretical case, someone can borrow money from them, mint it into USD plus, go out and borrow Bitcoin and lose all of it. So now the bank is have a huge credit risk problem because they have no idea what, what the customer is doing with USD plus. How do you address that? Sure, well, sure. How, go ahead, go ahead, Vipin. How do you address today if I borrow money from the bank? I can and go, go and uh, it. spend it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> spend it on. I mean, I may, I may tell them, look, this is my business plan, blah, blah, blah. You know, sometimes you have to take the money in tranches. You have to show that your business is, you know, like. Yes, I mean, if it, it's no different, but you still, the banks have the ways of checking what you're using it for because they can ultimately the money is spent on somewhere else and they can reconcile the bank account and, and you and you know there are ways you can verify between yeah, so don't so to answer that the protocol offers on-chain forensics don't forget the the users register their wallet with um, the financial institution, which is then registered on the protocol, and there's on-chain forensics there. Of course, you can transfer from one wallet to another wallet that's not registered and still go and gamble all your money away. Uh, but, you know, that's that's the beauty of um, the public layer protocols. You, you know, we can, we, we can only go as far as, you know, the regulations would require and the comfort level of the financial institutions as well. But we do put um, significant checks and balances in place to make sure that at least these wallets are not interacting with bad actors. Okay. Is there a public audit available for the smart contract code? In other words, if you go to, let's say one of the Ethereum sites, is yes. the smart contract visible? Sure. So we've had a private audit so far. Um, I guess we can have a, a public audit available. Um, I could take that to the team. If there's demand in market to see the smart contract code, we could we could definitely make it available. I mean, there are ways to reverse engineer the, uh, you know, the smart contract ABI but that is not often that is not the real code mm. but uh, you know usually um, transparency requires that you release it on a public ethereum uh, code uh, let's say uh, repository where anybody can go in and look at it uh, Okay, I'll definitely take that back to the team. In fact, uh, what what is the name of that uh, repository uh, money? There's uh, public uh, Ethereum smart contract repository. I don't I forgot. Huh? No, it doesn't doesn't strike my mind right now. Yeah, yeah, I'll I'll look it up and get back to you guys on that. Uh, now, I want to go back to some of the basic principles. Sure. Uh, one of them is the fact that, you know, you took the, I assume you took that taxonomy from the a paper published, I think, in 2018 or 2019 by, uh, among other people, I mean, who is a um, the avalanche guy? You have a sharp eye. Huh? <laughs> you have a yeah. sharp eye. I'm not exactly sure where it came from, to be honest, but I, I trust you. That looks very similar to um, to the um, taxonomy that was in that book. If you mm. go back, yeah. So, digging a little deeper into this. Mm -hmm. the collateral, and then you call it the reserve of backed assets, right? Yeah. As a mechanism, which is 
similar to what what you guys are doing mm -hmm. but there has been a um, there has been something that came up after the stable coin collapse which is basically the reserve should not be held at the bank that it should be held at the fed so in other words that portion becomes a narrow bank which is a mm -hmm. concept that has been around for a long time yes. that means the banks do not you know in that portion do not create money but that that account remains 100% liquid yes so 100% they're, they're... backed by the federal reserves i mean your bank's reserves on the, on the fed balance sheet Right. So this is this is again an example of where a CBDC can help, because if you think about it, um, we want to provide efficiencies in market and having to leverage the Fed um, when you want to cash out, unless of course we we are considering that the deposits in the collateral accounts are seen as tokens, um, where you know you are you are allowing consumers to mint and redeem based on these tokens and these collateral accounts. Um, so our, our, our approach was to leverage the collateral accounts, but put um, controls as to what the individual federation member banks can do with that uh, collateral. So there, are, you know, one of the advantages of this is, is that it potentially grows the assets under management for these institutions and um, it allows um, for the look for, for for highly liquid assets so you know if you want to get your you want to get you want to return back to fiat you know you can get access to that fiat in your bank account very quickly just a simple transfer from one account to another within the bank yeah this is where the um um the stress test uh, that was suggested by metallic yes okay yes. there are two two items there one is can you survive a total run that means all the usd plus out in the market is burned yeah uh, is is going to be converted back by what for whatever reason you want to get it back into uh, USD. Yes. Uh, that's one. The other is if the value of the asset goes up, uh, that means you have inflation or whatever, the asset becomes more and more valuable, meaning the pegged asset. I'm not talking about the reserve. So if you ever hold it, in other currencies or other, let's say liquid assets, if the liquid asset loses in relation to the pegged asset, then obviously you have problems. Meaning yeah. you're no longer 100% backed, you're partially backed. Uh, so unless you hold it completely in that asset, um, you cannot guarantee that the asset, when it goes up by 10 or 20 percent, of course, Vitalik was applying it fully to cryptocurrency backed. Yes, algorithm asset, yeah. assets, yeah. Which, which, which you know, which are over collateralized and. As long as the price is going up, everything is fine. <laughs> <laughs> but if the moment uh, it triggers a uh, sale because it prices went down, then you have problems. Yeah, I think I think that that's I think the being able to uh, meet the requirements of the stress test is critical, and by holding one hundred percent, at least one hundred percent fiat collateral in these 
reserve accounts, um, we're able to demonstrate that we can definitely um, fully redeem all USD plus and provide the fiat to those uh, registered wallet accounts, uh, no problem. On the on the point of the the other stress test, which is what happens if the asset goes up in value, uh, you know, I really don't think that applies to a fiat pegged stable coin because if the U.S. dollar increases in value, the value of the stable coin will also increase proportionately uh, because it's just like a a representation of the fiat um, one no, to one. No, that's not the problem. The problem is if you don't hold hundred percent fiat, then you know, mm. the value of the fiat going up will cause problems if you're you're collateralized into things like corporate bonds. Which, yeah, uh, but, but we don't contemplate that. Yeah. <laughs> which supposedly we want just, highly yeah. liquid assets, high quality liquid assets. Well, it, 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 it's a it's a spectrum, right? From US, from treasuries to uh, corporate bonds and of course beyond mortgage-backed securities you know oh, no. because as you go further and further away from this you're going to get better and better yield yeah but more risk um yeah, yes and we yes. and we want to be the most trustworthy so we are starting with 100 percent fiat collateral to kind of quell that noise and make it clear that you can redeem uh usd plus at any time Great. I think we are at time and the next group is already here. So I'm about to end the session. Um, and, and this will cut off everybody's, you know, including the new guys who logged in. I'm, I, I, I'm also trying to actually uh, pass on the host uh, to one of the, to Nico. Can I try? Let me see. Thanks, Vipin. I, I have a host code, so I can, uh, if you want to just go ahead and end this one, then we can all